I hope to do uh, over the next 45 minutes is serve a lot of pudding uh, so we can see if there's proof in it or not. Uh, I, and, but I uh, also try to give you a, a kind of a level set on uh, where we are today with this kind of underlying technology behind a lot of the cryptocurrency interest, but a lot of other use cases as well, which is this, this magical, mystical thing we call the blockchain, but which I, uh, I hope to actually boil down to some, some more approachable kind of uh, uh, examples. Uh, and then talk a little bit about what we're doing at Hyperledger, um, but not to make this an infomercial. There's tons of information at hyperledger.com org that will tell you more about how we work. Uh, the most important thing I'll just get out quickly is uh, we're an open source project. We're part of the Linux Foundation, uh, uh, which has been around for 15 years, kind of bringing together open source developers and then companies that have an interest in building on top of the uh, open source products that those developers build. Uh, and the Linux Foundation has done this in, uh, obviously, the Linux operating system, uh, but also in cloud computing, software-defined networking, automotive software, and then starting three years ago in blockchain technology. Um, and, uh, I, and so I've been executive director of Hyperledger for the past three years, uh, and we've pulled together a really interesting kind of kit of different frameworks and technologies. Uh, but the whole goal has been to try to boil down uh, a lot of the tribalism, as, you, as, you, as you've noted out there in the world, uh, uh, in the technology world, to try to come up with common reusable templates, frameworks, libraries, uh, mainly to handle the plumbing layer of the whole blockchain world, um, so that more more of you and more of us can move on to building interesting apps, interesting networks, and go about and, and actually solve some real problems. Um, so I, uh, first to level set, Really, I mean, the term blockchain, you have a, a, a thousand different opinions out there as to what actually should be allowed to be called a blockchain or not. Um, uh, sometimes it's used without the definite article. You know, people just say blockchain. You know, you've got to be in blockchain or on a blockchain, um, uh, in which it almost sounds culty or kind of a religion. Um, but the kind of the best way I, I, I think of it is it's kind of boiled down. Blockchain technology is really two component pieces, a distributed ledger and then smart contracts that can operate on top of the, that distributed ledger. Now, a distributed ledger is not just a database. In fact, uh, any, any use case that anybody can give you for using blockchain technology, uh, and, and all the ones that you'll see me uh, talk about here, every one of them could be done with a central database, with uh, something run by a Google or an Uber uh, or a, a PayPal. Central databases are really easy to build. We know how to scale them to billions of transactions a second. We know uh, they're, they're easier to update all and all classical kind of technical analyses, a central database is often going to be the faster, cheaper, better way to build uh, any type of application. But the key question is who gets to run that central database? And answering that question is what people have gravitated to around distributed ledgers. Now, this actually goes back before Satoshi Nakamoto in some ways uh, 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 to a world, uh, uh, well, to papers uh, that carry terms like Byzantine fault tolerance and, and Paxos as an algorithm uh, t back to the 80s when people were trying to design air traffic, I'm sorry, uh, airplane ticketing systems that uh, didn't depend upon a central provider. Uh, but they struggled in a lot of ways. Uh, the networks weren't able to, to really handle uh, how those algorithms needed to work. And Satoshi did come up with a novel uh, uh, invention called proof of work, which was how to get a very large arbitrary anonymous network of nodes to converge on a common, uh, 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 on, on the next link in the chain, so to speak, and then prove that and verify that amongst that large crowd. Um, and that is really important and interesting. Um, but because of that interest, because of the, the, the explosion in kind of uh, in proof of work in the Bitcoin space, that motivated a lot of folks to look at other technology approaches to solving what is classically called the double spend problem, right? Which is not just how do I put a set of transactions in order, but how do I keep somebody from being able to sp spend the same Bitcoin twice, to spend the same asset twice, you know, uh, uh, to, uh, to bring to these kinds of networks something that traditional centralized databases don't have, and even multi-headed databases don't have, which is uh, a layer of control and a layer of lo business logic that can be implemented across a network of parties who all mutually distrust each other, but through a system can verify that the uh, uh, transactions have high integrity. Uh, so that whole tr don't trust verify kind of principle, or as Ronald Reagan put it, trust but verify, um, uh, is key to all of these kinds of deployments as well. And then with smart contracts, there's a lot of automation that we can do uh
to uh, take that underlying record and either verify uh, that the, a proposed next transaction is valid, not just because somebody owns that asset that they're trying to transfer to somebody else, but because certain other conditions are met. You know, it's a weather insurance agreement and, and it turns out there was a drought uh, uh, in uh, Central California, so that insurance agreement should be paid out. Uh, or, uh, you know, three other transactions happened that all were precursors and necessary uh, in order for a fourth one to be accepted. That's that's the idea, this kind of multi-party business process workflow kind of thing, which, again, you can always do in a centralized way if there's somebody at the center to trust. But with these technologies, we can truly get to peers, cooperative peers um, of arbitrary size working together on a common system of record. And so mapping that to uh, ch real challenges in the real world uh, does lend itself to a, a view that says, all right, there are uh, uh, communities of businesses, right? Uh, and and uh, businesses that form consortia all over the world of lots of different scale, small uh, scale, you know, health information sharing networks in a single, you know, city region uh, in the United States or payment networks that uh, span uh, across borders, across geographies, uh, supply chain networks that that uh, deal with product that start with raw materials in uh, Africa, move their way to manufacturing hubs in Asia, move their way to distribution centers in Europe, and then end up, you know, in a Walmart in uh, the United States, right? Uh, uh, all sorts of scale, all sorts of use cases, all sorts of jurisdictions that apply as well. Because uh, we live in a world where we have things like data residency requirements or the GDPR. Uh, uh, we also live in a world where software has bugs. And, and so really what, uh, uh, you know, it's lo looking like blockchain technology is good for is automating the pieces that are automatable, uh, but uh, uh, having a role for human governance as well in the operation of those networks. And that's why it's not the case that there's nobody at the center of those markets. Um, there often is somebody who serves as a convener of that, of that kind of network. Uh, uh, who kind of says you're allowed to join if you agree to a certain set of uh, principles, a certain set of legal requirements. Maybe you even post a bond uh, if you violate that. Um, uh, uh, then, then you forfeit that 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 bond, right? Uh, but this is this is kind of uh, 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 very much like how the internet grew. The internet did not grow with uh, uh, and, and and evolve with everybody suddenly waking up one day and adopting absolutely the same bundle of technologies all the way from uh, through all the different OSI uh, layers, it started uh, and it still is a network of networks. Uh, uh, and it's incredibly heterogeneous at the ground floor. And we find ways to do transactions across these heterogeneous networks in really interesting ways. Um, I, I should also add uh, as an overlay to these kinds of networks, you will see things that will bind them together. Um, things like identity things like uh, uh, payment networks um, that will be used to kind of connect transactions across these and, and are being used today. And some of those might very well be the public cryptocurrency payment networks, right? Or, uh, I, I, you know, other, other types of, you know, blockchains of blockchains that are emerging. Uh, I tend to differ from Lorian is that I don't think there'll be just one uh, that will be the spanning layer across those. Uh, I think there'll be competition between them and competition's a healthy thing. Um, and so further on this point, I, I, there's a really a range that we're seeing in, in the deployment of these from uh, uh, on the left-hand side, uh, the pure permissionless and public uh, blockchain layers. Uh, you know, this is Bitcoin, Ethereum. And this is where you need uh, consensus mechanisms like proof of work to be able to uh, uh, allow those networks to have a consistent uh, and logical record that everybody can verify. Um, but as you start moving to the right and you get into what are known as permissioned networks, where, uh, again, as I mentioned, participation on that network uh, is uh, by both a set of technical rules, but also a governance mechanism. Then you have quite a few, uh, uh, then you have the ability to run other consensus mechanisms that aren't quite so energy burning uh, uh, and can handle uh, a fairly interesting transaction load. And they will differ from, some of those will still be public. You'll hear later today from Phil Winley, uh, who'll talk quite a bit about the sovereign network. Uh, uh, and this is a identity, uh, a self-sovereign identity network. It's something that connects identities across different blockchains. It will be one of uh, 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 these spanning networks across so that you can take your identity on one blockchain and use things about you on that to prove things about you somewhere else. Uh, and it is an example. It's, it's in late stage pilot today. I guess it goes Q1 sometime in the next quarter. Uh, um, uh, but Phil will tell you, I don't want to uh, uh, steal his thunder. Um, I, uh, but this will be a public permissioned blockchain network. Uh, 
Um, another example of what you might use in this space would be land titles, right? Uh, public information that are part of how we build society that you really want to know, uh, that everybody to know, but where you don't want everybody to be able to write to the land title network because there's legal requirements, there's a whole business process around transferring title of land from one party to another, uh, uh, and, 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 that, and so that kind of makes sense for that. In more uh, private settings, uh, uh, something where the visibility isn't necessarily to the whole wide world, but is bounded for data confidentiality reasons or otherwise, you'll have some types of payment networks. Uh, the recently launched JP Morgan Coin, for example, uh, is really a permissioned uh, private but, but intended to be a large network. I think right at launch, they're, with, uh, they're launching with about a dozen different nodes, but I presume they'll, they'll, they'll be looking for more. Uh, uh, and then uh, different supply chain applications, and I'll talk about them in a bit. And then you'll see uh, permissioned private small kinds of networks uh, in mobile roaming, in trade finance, in certain niche categories. Um, uh, but, uh, and then all, all the way on the right-hand side of this kind of spectrum is the centralized databases, and there'll be a, a ton of use cases for which that'll be suitable because there'll be some that we totally accept having private uh, 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 central operators in our markets for. Um, but my hope is that as the costs come down to deploy these kinds of blockchain networks, that'll get cheaper and cheaper. And more, and more suitable. Uh, just really quickly uh, to, to get in, uh, uh, talk about what we do at Hyperledger, this is uh, uh, something that most of you at the back of the room probably won't be able to read, so I won't dwell on it, but within Hyperledger, we're building a lot of the kinds of different technologies to support the, all the examples that I'll be giving from, from this point forward. Um, all of them are running on top of one or more of these different technologies. Um, some of them you've probably heard of, like Hyperledger Fabric, uh, which is uh, pretty widely deployed out there. It's, it's now uh, uh, in its fourth iteration version 1.4, uh, which is a long-term support release. Um, others like Hyperledger Sawtooth, which is competitive to Fabric. It's got a different approach to building a blockchain, something I won't go into here exactly why, uh, but uh, we often find competition brings out the best in parties and is kind of a healthy dynamic. Um, to Hyperledger Indy, which is the underpinning for the sovereign network and other uh, digital identity networks that are being built, uh, to things like Hyperledger Ursa, which is a library of cryptographic routines that we hope not only uh, to make, you know, put inside of all the other uh, 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 Hyperledger products so that you get more advanced zero-knowledge proof functionality or support for other countries' encryption standards, uh, but also be used by the public ledger communities as well. Um, and behind this that you don't see are thousands of developers working together across these different projects, are tens of thousands of people who come to our meetups, 100,000 people who've taken our edX course, uh, the 300 companies that are members of Hyperledger helping uh, drive the organization of this activity. Uh, oh, and those, those writing those code, none of them work for me. Uh, I have zero developers working for me that I get to tell who to work on what. Um, this is all a bottoms up organic kind of thing coming from those companies that are uh, uh, building these kinds of platforms and then the applications on top. So let me talk about uh, one of the ones that was announced this week at Mobile World Congress in Barcelona, which is where I, I was uh, just at on Monday and Tuesday. Um, T-Systems, uh, uh, Deutsche Telekom announced this thing with SK Telekom and a number of other parties were there using uh, uh, a distributed ledger uh, and smart contracts on top of that to fight uh, mobile roaming fraud, which is a $38 billion a year problem in the global uh, mobile carrier space. Uh, and the whole use case here is solved when, for when somebody shows up in South Africa with a phone that is registered in the United States uh, and knowing very quickly what services are, are allowed to be provided uh, to that that end user, and then uh, what? What? Uh, uh, how much? You know, uh, uh, capacity do I have? Uh, you know, to be able to start making calls and things like that, right? Um, uh, and this is something that today uh, uh, is a point-to-point -point kind of thing that's reconciled uh, on a batch-oriented way, like on a daily basis, and in some cases monthly basis, um, which creates a tremendous burden uh, upon the different carriers. This is a way of saving a tremendous amount of money, but also fighting a huge category of fraud. Uh, Thirty-eight billion a year of services provided before those checks come back to say, yes, this person, you know, shouldn't be able to make, you know, calls to, uh, 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 to the Philippines or something like that, right? Um, uh, so, so this is in late stage pilot now. It's anticipated going into production uh, later this year. Uh, and I, I, they, there was a huge amount of talk of this at Mobile World, uh, talk about this at Mobile World Congress. Um, earlier this year, uh, er, sorry, late last year, uh, Swisscom, uh, uh, another uh, telco, launched a project with a uh, securities exchange in Switzerland 
Switzerland for equities in small companies. Um, this is, if you want to call it a security token, you might not be too far off. Um, it's a private network that looks a lot like the kinds of networks that are built for equities exchanges, but using a distributed ledger underneath for, for operational efficiency to make it easier to bring other uh, investment shops into the network. Uh, I, and this is a, a key way that, that the Swiss government and, and the Swiss regulators are trying to get much more digital about how, how these kinds of systems work. Um, again, this is not a public network, uh, but their goal here is to use this tech to be able to onboard uh, uh, investors from all over the world as quickly as they can. Uh, in another uh, way, a uh, uh, very different kind of use case, uh, uh, in traceability of supply chain materials, you probably heard about the diamond use case, uh, 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 built, uh, the diamond uh, blockchain built by Everledger. One that's also in production, uh, it covers the rare earth metals such as tantalum and, and other uh, materials that uh, come from uh, this continent. Um, uh, and implement a uh, uh, tracking and inspections regime uh, uh, to try to ensure that those materials come from known good mines, from known good operators, uh, rather than from uh, mines that don't implement health and safety checks or labor, labor controls, those sorts of things. Um, this is critically important to companies like Apple who want to be able to uh, attest to their end users that the product inside uh, of an Apple phone comes from uh, uh, non-slave labor sources and other ethical sources. Um, this doesn't necessarily guarantee that bad materials don't make their way into the supply chain. Uh, just because something is written to a blockchain doesn't make it true. Uh, it should make it verifiable, though. Uh, you should be able to see, okay, this mine claimed to put this bundle of tantalum into, uh, into that truck and send it off. Now, can you co correlate that to an inspector who was on the ground who authorized and said, yeah, this is good, this really came out of the ground, or did it come off a truck from the Congo next door? I, I, you know, that, there's still a need for inspectors uh, and such in that kind of regime. But as it makes its way through the supply chain, and, it's, and the digital title to that is handed off one party to the next, it becomes much harder to slip in illicit uh, product midway through that supply chain and on its way to the tail end. So this is, an, again, in production today, uh, I, and, and uh, I, I, hard to get a sense of scale, like how much of the uh, tantalum market is running on top of it, uh, but it's got a substantial amount of momentum behind it and, 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 and is fairly high profile. Uh, one network that's easier to quantify uh, is there's a supply chain, I'm sorry, a trade finance network uh, uh, started in Singapore, although it, it spans Australia and investors in China and other places in Southeast Asia, built by a startup company called DLT Ledgers. And so uh, I want to emphasize there's role for startup companies all across the map in building these kinds of networks. They partnered with the Development Bank of Singapore and a uh, large firm called Agricorp that represents 4,500 growers uh, in, uh, in Australia. Australia. And it's a network for doing extensions of letters of credit, uh, tracking of uh, bill of materials, and it even has an IoT component to it as well, uh, so that as product makes its way through the chain and gets delivered, all of that is in a consistent uh, visible ledger. Uh, and, as, and, and as parties participate in the system, they build a history that then becomes a key part of, of the KYC process and can bring down the cost of financing for, for exporters and importers and that sort of thing. Um, in two months of operation, this data is uh, recent as of December, so I should probably update it. But in two months of production operation, uh, they uh, conducted 2,450 trades on this platform. Um, now, that doesn't sound like a lot. It represents 3.2 million actual entries on the ledger, different events. Uh, but uh, in, in dollar figures, it, uh, it correlates to $750 million of letters of credit extended uh, to, to that network uh, of, tra uh, 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 of trade deals basically completed, um, uh, representing, again, 4,000 different farmers uh, involved in those trades. So this is cool. Uh, and for the startup company that's acting as the convener of that network, that's real revenue. Uh, they, they take a, a small slice of that, of course, uh, less than a percent, I assume. Um, but this is a huge uh, 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 running operation, uh, operating uh, uh, network. Um, in China, there's a similar network set up by the larger banks uh, using, again, open source software and, 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 and everything kind of themselves. Uh, I actually, they have a couple of startup partners in this too. Um, again, it's a letter of credit uh, extension network. And this is, we see trade finance as one of these key uh, places where they operate across jurisdictions. There's no central judge to appeal to if a party, you know, in China doesn't make good on its deals, you know, that sort of thing. So really uh, having the traceability and, the, and, the, and, and such that the 
the blockchain gives you is, is really good. Um, in this case, it's China Minsheng Bank, China Citic Bank, Bank of China, Suning Bank. Um, I, I, and the day that they launched, they extended 100 million renminbi uh, in letters of credit, which is about $16 million. Now they do over a billion dollars a, a day, I'm sorry, a billion renminbi, so $150 million a day. That number has also grown. We, I met with them last week, and they wouldn't talk numbers anymore, which was, uh, uh, but they, because they say it's so large. Um, uh, but it's uh, uh, easily in the billions of renminbi uh, uh, total that have been conducted across the network um, and, and growing. They're adding more partners to that and it's really exciting to see. There's more of a top-down thing for sure. In China, blockchain technology represents more of a leapfrog kind of technology, um, allows them to avoid generations of infrastructure investment that has been made in the West in intermediary organizations. Um, uh, there's still a role, again, for governance organizations, and what, that's one of the roles that the People's Bank of China is playing in this network. Uh, but it's, uh, uh, it, it, I, I think this is why we're seeing so many use cases and so much interest in this tech in Asia as a way to develop and digitize and automate uh, these kinds of business processes in a world where there's even less trust in central institutions than we have in the States. Uh, similarly, there's a network called We.Trade uh, that I, I is, I, I'm not clear what their volume is, they don't talk volume yet, um, but they are in pilot mode uh, and moving to production this year. Uh, and, but they have backing from uh, Deutsche Bank, HSBC, uh, NetAccess, Rabobank, Societe Generale, basically the, the, the major banks that conduct trade finance in the world. And so there's this momentum building and it's, and it's really exciting to see. There's other production deployments longer. I won't bore you with them, uh, but they are in other domains such as real estate. The National Association of Realtors in the United States has set up a network to connect its agents, but also soon title offices and uh, uh, other, other uh, parties that get involved whenever somebody buys and sells a house. There's, there's uh, in most transactions, eight to 10 different organizations. And I don't know if you've, anybody try to buy, I don't know if it's hard here, but buying a house in the United States can be a multi-month, you know, stack of paperwork that, that is just impossible for the average person to keep track of. It's where there's a lot of room for fraud. It's where we have had major economic disasters in the past, like the 2008 mortgage crisis. So that field really is desperate for blockchain technology as a way to bring uh, better coordination and predictability to their work. Um, I'm sure you've heard about the, the food trust network that has folks like Walmart on it. Walmart will be mandating this year that all of their tier one suppliers for leafy green vegetables, uh, lettuce and spinach and those sorts of things, get on that network so that when bad product is discovered in the market, E. coli and a head of lettuce, they can much more quickly uh, within minutes trace where uh, that came from. Was it a farm? Was it uh, a truck? You know, was it a processing plant? Um, that's, that's something that today takes weeks to do. And in the meantime, they throw away all spinach from California uh, or all, you know, lettuce from the Midwest, which is billions of dollars tossed down the drain. Um, so they are extremely enthusiastic about uh, using that technology. It's hard to quantify what the cost savings are just yet, but you know we're, we're within a year of you know somebody being able to do an our Harvard Business School case study in, uh, on that. Obviously, I mentioned Everledge or the diamond industry. That's now tracking about a single digit percentage of the diamonds uh, that are flowing out there and growing very quickly. Uh, and they as a company are going into wine and other types of luxury goods, so that's exciting. Uh, and then I'll just uh, mention Change Healthcare, which is a healthcare company in the US. They route insurance claims payments uh, and they're doing 50 million transactions a day on a production network, uh, running on Hyperledger fabric, but, uh, uh, but just to give you a sense that this is stuff that's running in production in real. Um, sorry about the formatting of this slide. Um, but, and, and so one of the things that uh, uh, this is asking, this is kind of begging for, all these different examples, you know, we know that the plural of anecdote is not data, right? Uh, we really want better data in this space. Um, and data is something that the cryptocurrency community has in spades. Uh, uh, they have a great site, I'm sure all of you hit reload on, uh, called CoinMarketCap, where to 10 decimal points, you can find the, uh, the value of any of the, uh, the coins in the, in the community. I think all 1,600 uh, active coins are still listed there. We know we need this for the permission ledger world. Um, uh, there's something called the unbounded network that has spun up, which is self-reporting and, and, and not as rigorous or, or uh, it's obviously hard to get it data about uh, what's going on on these private networks. Um, but it, uh, today it's uh, a self-reported database uh, tracking, uh, and these numbers are old, over 100 different production uh, fabric-based networks, about 40 different uh, Ethereum networks, although it's unclear because some of that includes dApps like uh, CryptoKitties. Um, 
So, uh, I, I, uh, but, but probably that number, uh, just based anecdotally on the, the people we talked to. 16 different Corda networks, 13 Sawtooth networks, uh, seven uh, Stellar and six Quorum networks. Uh, and this feels like the right distribution from the conversations I've had and what, what you know, gets reported out there in the press and that sort of thing. Um, so hundreds of networks now running live uh, and, uh, and drawing a, a lot of interest in the need for things that are cross-cutting technologies around standards, around payments and settlement, around identity, and so that's where we will see things really uh, taking off. Uh, again, sorry for the formatting. Um, this is also really uh, 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 an example of where, uh, 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 well, another sign this past year, let me put it that way, another sign this past year that this space has now gone from being kind of early adopter, R&D, let's do a proof of concept and see what's going on to, all right, let's get this stuff in pilot and production and make some money with it, is all of the major cloud providers worldwide now offer blockchain as a service types of functionality. Um, and this is not run a, 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 a you know a, a, a cryptocurrency mining operation. This is run a node on Fabric, on Sawtooth, on Corda, on Quorum. Uh, almost every one of these has an in-house <laughs> blockchain technology as well, um, which uh, uh, you, you you know you see these R&D teams inside of companies kind of work on something and then put it out there and see if anyone will pick it up. Uh, but uh, but all of them as well. Every uh, uh, label here is also deployed Fabric as a managed service, meaning not just hey, here's a system image that I'll throw on some bare metal or in a container and run for you. No, this is actually them saying, we will commit to an SLA, we will commit to uptime, will help you with performance issues, uh, and that's really exciting. Uh, and it's global as well. Um, I've spent a lot of time this year in China. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, around the world, this is me about 12 months ago standing in Antarctica explaining uh, Hyperledger to a bunch of penguins um, uh, and uh, an ice flow uh, going by. I was invited by the government of Chile to go speak at a conference there, and they threw in as a speaker gift a, a, a trip on a C-130 uh, for the speakers down to their uh, Air Force Base, uh, the Chilean Air Force Base in Antarctica. Uh, for like a couple hour visit. So I was like, why not? Um, I, I do spend a lot of time on a plane though. And, and again, back to China, uh, I, there the interest has been, uh, I, as I mentioned, in, in uh, kind of creating automated and digital, digitalized systems for all sorts of cross-border flows. Uh, but there's been a real temptation on their part to try to define a China-specific ledger. I see other countries uh, kind of going, well, this is a national thing, right? You know, um, China has their Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, and, and that was kind of, you know, their thinking was, well, should there be a global China network or a global you know, China technology? Does that become a base for projection of power? I think we've been able to convince, um, uh, and, and in other countries as well, uh, folks that at government levels, at business levels, that these networks need to be global, just like the internet is global, and just like that the fact that the internet has withstood uh, uh, attacks on that globality. You know, we still have, there might be national firewalls all over the place, but there still is one uh, network for uh, the domain name system. There's still one uh, shared IP address space. At, at its core, we're still a global internet. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's worth fighting, it's worth protecting. Likewise with blockchain technology, there's a lot of concerted work, and it's not just Hyperledger, there's other groups doing this as well, to try to ensure that the technology base, which is all open source, uh, open source is table stakes in this industry, but making sure that that is multi-stakeholder open source, collaboratively built, including by companies in China, companies in Russia, ch companies in uh, the African subcontinent. Uh, uh, so, uh, Circular, the startup I mentioned, uh, is based in Rwanda uh, uh, and, and has uh, developers there. Um, these need to not only be globally operated, but globally developed and globally commercialized. Uh, and commercialized by commercialized, I mean all those companies that are involved in building and supporting this. Uh, uh, and that's really what 2019 is going to be about. I call it, when 2019 is when, you know, you've probably heard the phrase, when the going gets weird, the weird go pro. Um, uh, I, this is the year where I think a lot of these experiments, a lot of these differences that we have as, uh, as tribes, as communities, start to net each other out. Uh, and, and really we get down to the business of building these networks, digitalizing things and figuring out how do we make sure that they create value and that we answer the concerns about interoperability just enough to be able to start doing transactions across ledgers and building these spanning ledgers as well. So the, the first observation I have, uh, and that I think really will be the year that, uh, 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 this year will be the year that it shines, is in self-sovereign identity systems. Um, self-sovereign identity as a concept uh, formally was more or less defined in 2013 in an essay written by Christopher Allen. I'll give due cre credit to him. Um, uh, as, a, as a principle though, this idea of moving away from the centralized Facebook style, mainframe style, log in with a name and password and all the interesting stuff about you is over there in a central server and maybe you get access to 
to it. Maybe you can route it to somebody else. That's going away. Uh, instead, it'll be about a wallet. It'll be about something you hold close to you. And uh, things like your passport, your driver's license, your diploma, your medical records, your financial records, all of these are records that are portable from the systems that issued them. And, uh, and you should be able to share them and track how you share them and withdraw the sharing of, uh, 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 at, 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 your, at, at your disposal, right? This is a big idea. This is bigger even than blockchain. I think it'll be a bigger impact uh, on the average consumer uh, than uh, even cryptocurrencies will. Most of these other use cases I mentioned are all behind the scenes, business to business. Consumers won't even really notice, except maybe fees will go down for certain things or, or portability of some data will get cheaper. Um, this is the thing that end users will, uh, are, are really crying out for now with uh, uh, the concerns about privacy uh, and concerns about the uh, role that large IT companies, large Silicon Valley companies have in everybody's lives. This, this, is, this is the cool thing. And so Phil will talk more about this, I'm sure, uh, uh, later today. Um, and underpinning some of this uh, will be technology at Hyperledger. There's lots of other folks, other open source projects building things here. But I'm really happy that we can be uh, playing a helpful role here. Um, we're also going to see those cloud providers that I mentioned and others uh, start to even professionalize their offerings further uh, and, and respond to demands from the market for interoperability. A key thing you want to be able to answer is if I start up a blockchain network on one cloud, you know, with five nodes representing five businesses, but all of us operating uh, in the same cloud for efficiency reasons, for bootstrapping reasons, I want to know that tomorrow I can easily, without any technical barrier, add another node from another cloud provider from representing another business onto that same network. And there should be no technical barrier to doing that. There might be legal requirements, but no technical barrier to doing that. And so that's something we'll be leading an effort at Hyperledger to try to help drive a standardization and a, and a certification process for providers of those types of, of nodes. Um, we also see developers uh, uh, and, and the uh, solutions providers that they work for um, uh, uh, raising the bar on what it means to be a blockchain developer, what it means to know how these tools work. Um, there's a lot of folks who still, I mean, writing distri distributed applications is hard conceptually. Um, most developers grew up in a world where you could build things and deploy them once and, and everybody trusted you with their data. Building things for a, a trust but verify world is much harder. And so we are launching, um, we've launched a certification program for developers and for administrators at Hyperledger. Uh, uh, we'll see other groups do that as well, I'm sure. Uh, and uh, uh, we'll see service providers start to, to be certified there too. So you know if you hire a startup or an Accenture or an IBM or a local uh, uh, you know, IT company to go and build an app for you or you're going to use one of their blockchain apps, that it's something that actually makes appropriate use of this underlying technology. Um, I'm certainly of the, of the belief that we'll see more production networks. I have a Google alert on uh, uh, Hyperledger, of course, uh, uh, as anyone would with their own project. Um, and pretty much three times a week-ish, I see announcements of new networks coming up from people we've either never engaged with or maybe had a conversation at a conference. Uh, and that's exciting. That means you get this kind of decentralized innovation going on, even if it means a whole lot of networks out there. And I think we will see these networks combine and merge as they grow. Uh, I don't know that it all goes to one, but um, the scope of these will, will find, you know, it's like water finding its own level, right? Uh, I, uh, but seeing now, like all these different lights uh, coming up, says to me, we're getting a lot of people trained out there. We're getting a lot of businesses understanding what this means. Uh, so we'll see more production networks uh, this year and getting real metrics as to how those should work, right? Getting a sense of comparing apples to apples, you know, what, how many transactions are happening? What's the value behind them? Uh, how do we go beyond the anecdote is going to be really important. Um, uh, back to a n kind of uh, a nerdy kind of uh, pr point of view, um, I'm really hopeful that we can get uh, more componentization going on. Um, and by that, I mean today, a lot of the blockchain technology stacks are these monolithic stacks that handle everything from, you know, kind of the container level upward. Uh, and uh, where they're developed and standardized and clients are built all by tightly integrated teams, which it's very easy to, in, in software to get tunnel vision. It's very easy to believe that all the smart people in the world work for you uh, or you've pulled them together in the room and you just have to like bang out something innovative and cool and everyone else will, will adopt it because it'll be self-evidently uh, uh, huge and cool. Um, the reality is that software, uh, especially open source software, works best the more that it is distributed, the more that it's shared, the more that people are building on top of each other. And uh, those types of, of, or, of uh, 
efforts are not run uh, by anonymous individuals. They're not run by, uh, uh, in, a, in a disconnected way. There's leadership in open source. Uh, and so uh, uh, that's a role that uh, we at the Linux Foundation and we at Hyperledger are hoping to provide just enough infrastructure, just enough coordination, just enough kind of introducing two people from opposite sides of the planet who want to solve the same problem. That's our role, right? Uh, and then have a place where the licenses are standardized, where the provenance of the code is standardized, where security uh, uh, scans are done and bug bounties are posted and uh, all this kind of, uh, kind of work. Um, and it wouldn't work for us if it was just, you know, hyperledger fabric or nothing, right? A fabric itself is composed of a lot of pieces uh, 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 and we uh, uh, and, and, and other stacks uh, kind of break those out as well. So uh, uh, with Hyperledger Ursa, which is our cryptography library, we're hoping to make the first step there. And I think we'll see componentization of things like smart contract systems uh, uh, or uh, identity networks, identity systems. Um, and that's, that's uh, something I think this year, that should be an uh, recurring theme. Uh, I, I, and, I, and that's going to require us, and, and we have been reaching out to the public chain communities as well, uh, saying to folks at like Zcash, for example, hey, we notice you're using zero knowledge proofs as are we, or we're, there are ways we can learn from each other and work on common code together perhaps. Um, and then finally, we will see uh, out there uh, settlement network coins. Uh, um, uh, you've probably saw the announcement about JP Morgan coin. Um, I, uh, that uh, is completely unsurprising because I think you're going to see other uh, networks of banks, networks of uh, financial institutions get together and drive common settlement coins uh, across them. Uh, the Monetary Authority of Singapore and the Hong Kong Monetary Authority have been working on projects together for uh, basically real-time growth settlement systems between the, their member banks and their member trade finance organizations and, and such. Um, You'll see central banks issue digital currencies. Um, they likely won't be doing that on any of the cryptocurrency networks. They'll probably be doing that on networks they build and then have parties easily join. Uh, uh, but that'll give them the same uh, uh, monetary policy flexibility that they have uh, outside of the blockchain world, which they expect and they demand. Um, uh, so we'll see a lot of exciting stuff this year. Uh, and it's an exciting place to, space to be in. Um, and, it, and this past year has seen a lot of kind of the philosophizing about what should be possible and what hopefully can happen uh, actually boil down into running systems and running code. Uh, and uh, I hopefully you all share that excitement too. And, and if you're interested, again, I didn't want to make this a, um, an infomercial for us, but hyperledger.org. Uh, if you're developers uh, here or if you know of developers working with this stuff, uh, there's a whole side of what we do which is focused on that and trying to help them be more powerful and, uh, and be a part of the open source development. But even if you're a non-developer, uh, We've got ways that we can work with you to, to understand um, what you're trying to build. Uh, we, we have all sorts of special interest groups that we've uh, started in healthcare, in telecom, in other fields. Um, this is really a broad-based movement, and I'd love to have you all kind of along for the ride. So with that, I think I'm happy to take questions or move on if I'm late. Uh, oh, cool. Right, if you could raise your hand again so we can get the mics to you. We've got a question in the front over here. Any other questions? If you do have a question, just raise your hand so the people with the mics can see you. Great. Thanks so much for the chat. Um, James, I work for a bank, so I'm interested more so on the financial side. Please double-click on Hyperledger Ursa, the, the cryptography. Um, uh, just double-click on it. What's, what's going on there? What's the big idea? What are you chasing? What problems are you trying to solve? What are you exploring? Right. Um, so, uh, blockchain technology makes pretty sophisticated use of um, hashing uh, functions. And so, uh, hashing functions, as I'm sure you all know, is when you take a file, a uh, large file, and you kind of uh, put it through a, a grinder and come out with a special code that's like a fingerprint, right? Uh, and uh, it's really pushed the envelope on uh, uh, improving the overall security and verifiability, uh, which, you know, long story short, help avoid uh, two, uh, the same fingerprint working for two documents or avoid making it easy to forge a document and end up with the same fingerprint. So, uh, uh, and those types of hashing routines and encryption routines, encryption for writing uh, encoded messages to the blockchain that are still confidential between two parties, but uh, uh, in an, a zero-knowledge proof world uh, are still verifiable. Zero-knowledge proofs are a way of being able to say, here's a sequence of transactions or, or some other types of encrypted data that you can't see what the underlying encrypted data is, but you can verify for yourself mathematically that uh, the say the transactions if they're about coins moving back and forth net 
out to a certain position. Um, so it's a way of bringing confidentiality to transactions, but still having that verifiability, right? Um, lots of exciting stuff happening in those kind of two ways. Um, and with Hyperledger, we saw that a lot of our projects were starting to independently re-verify or independently implement those types of uh, idioms and systems. Uh, I, for example, Indy, uh, Hyperledger Indy uses zero knowledge proofs to provide a, a, a way for people to prove my passport is valid to this business without that business now knowing everything else about me tied to my passport number, right? Um, uh, so all that is pretty important. And we also were discovering that certain countries like China and Russia and the United States were saying, here are our nationally approved encryption standards and uh, products uh, that hope to be used in these markets need to pass these encryption standards. My personal p politics and philosophy, philosophy and belief is anybody should be able to use m any type of mathematics for any reason, right? So, uh, but living in the real world, it was like, okay, how do we most easily support these alternative encryption standards? And that was by putting it into a commonplace and allowing everybody else to use it. Does that answer your question? Okay. Thank you so much. We've got a question in the front here and we've also got one in the back there. Morning. Uh, Saki Lamini from the Embassy of Switzerland. Uh, I work with essentially channeling investments and uh, resources from Switzerland in Zogin Crypto Valley to Sub-Saharan Africa. A question that I had, you touched on it a little bit, how best can a nation state or a country proactively create regulation that helps foster the growth of uh, distributed ledger technology and uptake in, uh, innovation in regulation that isn't stifling or pulling back the actual growth? How best can a country actually work with the entrepreneurs and the innovators in the space to bring about economic growth? So I really like what the Monetary Authority of Singapore has been doing in this space. So they are a regulator, but um, they've realized that it's not enough to have just lawyers and accountants on staff. You need programmers as well. Because you need to understand when a, when a vendor comes to you or, or somebody who's hoping to get their system you know, approved by you, when they say, here's the certain technical promises that are made, um, it's a, the only way you have to evaluate the risk of whether those promises are true or not is if you can understand at a technical level uh, the connection between those claims and the underlying code. Right? Um, and so MAS has, has developers on staff. Uh, I see regulators like the CFTC in the United States uh, and others hiring as many, they told us, hiring as many developers as lawyers these days. Um, but then there's also a need to get hands-on. And so MAS ran this pr thing called Project Ubin, which was kind of a bake-off between different blockchain uh, platforms to, do, to implement a real-time gross settlement system. And the interesting thing is their analysis of that and uh, of the different uh, offered uh, uh, um, platforms, the different candidates that different teams worked on. They worked with the public sector to, to build kind of candidate uh, RTGS systems. Um, they then required all of those efforts to be open sourced. So when a vendor would claim, hey, we submitted this and it got approved, it would become the basis for others to very quickly be able to adopt the same methodology, the same code even, uh, uh, and, and quickly build a network, right? Rather than just one party being approved and then others needing to be approved. So part of it is understanding the tech. Part of it, I think, is understanding how open source can be a tool for the regulator to help drive standardization and drive mass and, uh, and rapid adoption within a market. Because all this is about stuff is about markets. It's not just approving one bank's usage. It's got to be about spinning these markets up uh, and, make, and being agile about them. Um, so uh, those would be my main, main things. Uh, uh, I mean, regulators do lots of other interesting, fun stuff that I, you know, I, I tend to believe fewer regulation is better, but I'm definitely not a no regulations person. I did find even the GDPR. Uh, had a lot of good intent, uh, and we'll see how they get approved, how the data protection authorities implement that on the ground. Um, but I think thinking about the role of individuals and consumers and privacy and avoiding the word user, right? Because there's, like, there's only two industries in the world that call their customers users. Um, I, I, I'll let you figure out what the other one is. Um, I, I, you know, this is something that uh, blockchain technology and, and, the, and the systems that get implemented all need to have as a first class priority in, in how these roll out is how to protect the privacy and the dignity and the sovereignty of individuals using their systems. And government regulators are in a unique position to fight for the interests of their citizens in those kinds of systems. Thank you so much. We have one minute left, so we have one question in the back. Atisha, I'll ask you to ask your question in the break. And I'll be around all day. So. My name is Toby van der Spey. I'm from Licker and um, also Swiss-based cryptocurrency exchange. So a lot of Swiss people, yeah? Um, thanks so much for a very insightful talk so far, Ben. My question to you is about direct cyclic graph technology and whether you think direct cyclic graphs, whether you think that will finally get us to the plain place where payment processes like Visa and Master 
can actually run fast enough verification and put that ledger on a blockchain. I, I'm, I'm really not certain that DAGs should, uh, are, are, I mean, again, everyone has a different definition of what's blockchain technology, but DAGs aren't about forging a common ledger. You do get these disconnected kind of ledgers, that's how they uh, have high claims of transaction throughput, but it's not apples to apples comparable to transactions into a shared ledger that's truly shared amongst all the different parties in a room, right? Uh, where everybody then has the right to be able to fork, where everyone has the you know, full knowledge of what's gone on in the past. Uh, DAGs seem to solve a different problem, and, 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 and I'm still, uh, I wish I knew more, uh, because every time I scratch the surface of uh, the tangle, you know, I come up going, well, the web is a DAG. Uh, and the web has these problems around verifiability and, and, and getting a consistent, uniform, global version of the truth, so to speak. And so I bet they have a role out there, but um, I think they've been oversold to some degree uh, uh, as a solution for the kinds of problems that blockchain solve. Arguably, distri distributed ledgers have been oversold as well, so we, I, I, we can grant everybody a bit of hyperbole uh, or irrational exuberance, perhaps. Uh, but uh, um, DAGs, I'm still wrestling with. I just don't know how they fit uh, in the rest of the world. If somebody wanted to bring a DAG project to Hyperledger, I'd let the community decide if that was a good idea or not. Um, my personal take is I, I, I'm still learning, and I'm skeptical. So we'll see. Thank you so much, Brian.